There it is. Kevin and I are separated. We're fighting. Oh, I'm just joking. No, um, there were some, there have been men who have, today we consider them female names. But there's a number of men. I just can't think of any else. John Wayne was Leslie. Marion Morrison. Marion, yes. You know, what's your name? My name Dirk Cavendish. Oh, is that your name? No, Dirk's my middle name. Oh, what's your first name? Marion. Okay, Dirk. Carol. You know, Carol. Carol. Yep. I like, when I think of Carol, I think of, um. A racist dude from the 80s. No, monster. Oh. I think of, um, uh, I'm thinking of initials with Carol. H.M. Carol, D.M. Carol. Why am I thinking of? Carol. Who, who wrote uh, Alice in Wonderland? Lewis. Lu Carol. Lewis Carroll. That was his last name. Okay, so here's why I messed this up. Because Lewis had the initials with it. C.S. Lewis. I was making an, an accidental Lewis. name portmanteau. Clyde Staples. Yeah. Right? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> that was his name. What was it? Clyde Staples. Clyde Staples Lewis. Lewis. <laughs> I love them. Oh, that's beautiful. I, I knew there was a man named Carrie one time. Carrie, yes. And then I've heard of a man named, there was a, one person we knew. A man named Stacy. Stacy, there's one I was thinking of too. Yeah. Stacy, um, Leslie, and today these are like almost exclusively like ladies' mm -hmm. names. But so just to buck against the tide. Morgan. Morgan. Morgan that can so be I always yeah. thought that Morgan was a man's name, and then I heard Morgan used as a lady's name, and I was like, oh. Morgan that was Le Fay, the witch, and the. Uh, that's yes. Mm -hmm. Arthurian yes. legend. That was the first time I heard Morgan. It was his, uh, uh, his half sister. No, yep. no, it was no, a modern no, take on Morgan. Shirley. Shirley, yeah, Shirley. Both. Uh, Shirley. Yeah. yeah. Shirley. But wasn't Shirley a nickname for Sherlock? But is Sherlock like an Arthur Conan Doyle imagination, <clears throat> or was that a common name used at the time? I don't know. Either way, it's all simpler than Mara Shala Hashbad. Uh, there's an actress named Michael. Yes, yeah. Miss Michael Learned. She yeah. was in the Waltons. Yeah. Yeah. And then That's right. Mike um, Micah. Micah has, can be, mm -hmm. <coughs> every time, because when my dad was in the service, so I was always in different schools every three years, and they always thought I was going to be a boy, so they had me, like, on the boy's side, and they had, and then they'd be like, oh, you're a girl. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> well, look at all the women's names. <laughs> yes. That yeah. like Ernestine and Ernestine, Roberta yes, and that were um, feminized, yeah. like even Michaela is a feminized version of yeah. Michael, mm -hmm. yep. whereas in the Bible, Michael is a woman's name as well. Uh, so it's interesting. No E. Different. No, is Michael spelled with an E in the Bible? No, yes, it is. Is no. it A L? A L. I don't know what translation yeah. you have. No, I'm just I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, the old English. What is A E L? Female version of Michael is A L. Call it old English. King James is in modern English. Yes, it is. It's not in today's English, but it. You know how it is. It's King not James, um, English the Canterbury is, Tales. Right, right. So King Fonda James. Fonda Alvaro was the short soup to the drop that March Spurs to the root. That's Fonda more. Fonda Levy Vine and Swiss Liqueur. Okay. So, right? so what you just sounded was like Gaelic. And Gaelic mm -hmm. is like one of the, I learned this when I was doing studies for uh, etymology and the word Easter. It really took me on a deep dive. And Gaelic is one of, and Germanic is one of like our roots. The Big. biggest mother language of English is yes. German. Yes, I was super. I thought it'd be Italian mm -hmm. or not Italian. No, it's a different uh, Latin or two different, French. Two different pathways. Two super different pathways. Yes. and German was like. That's why English we will, and German. We will so be close. your mother language. I was like, all right. German and English. You know, I could have learned this at home. Farfet Nugent. Farfet Sorry to everybody. <laughs> oh, Destry. That's a great point of view. So Destry, my friend Destry. Um, he said, I've only met one Destry and it was a girl. I thought it was a tough guy's name. It is a tough guy's name. John Wayne played a Destry, didn't he? No, it wasn't. It was uh, um, um, Jimmy Stewart or somebody. Okay, Jimmy Stewart. I was thinking it was either <laughs> yeah, like Ben Cleese. It may not have been Jimmy Stewart. But, but it was a, he was a rough and tumble cowboy. He was a cowboy. Destry, you were named after a rough and tumble cowboy. All right. So oh, well, what about Susan Dolan? Susan? A boy named Sue. Oh, Johnny Cash. <laughs> Johnny Cash. We're named Sue. All right. We have killed enough time. Thank you. We, we did have more viewers when we started. I will just say They're that. Done. So, They're like, I'm yeah. out. Audie Murphy and Jimmy Stewart. I okay. Yep. Destry. Destry, you're the man. I love that you chip in here. Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12. 
There's 28 verses. Let's split it up into fours, enough for seven of us to read four verses. I'll begin. Whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge. But he that hateth reproof is brutish. A good man obtains favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The wicked are overthrown, that are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. A man shall be commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. <clears throat> he that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. He that tilled his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. The wicked desireth the next of evil men, but the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. The wicked is snared. I just lost it. The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out. Pants of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. <laughs> he that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but the counselors of peace is joy. But to the counselors of peace is joy. There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Lion lips are an abomination to the Lord but they that deal truly are his delight. A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Heaviness is in the heart of man. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor at the way of the wicked. Seduceth them. The slothful man roast, roasteth not that which he took, which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious in the way of the righteousness, in the way of righteousness is life, and in <clears throat> that way thereof there is no death. Amen. The Proverbs <clears throat> twelve. A lot of really, really, really cool, insightful, and path-altering proverbs here. Um, what are your thoughts? Any of these stand out to you in particular, of these proverbs? I, I have written down uh, Proverbs 12.10, A righteous man regarded mm. the life of his beast. Mm -hmm. I have written on the side. Take care of your car. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, I get that. It'll take care of you. <laughs> that was a, yeah. That was a twist I didn't expect, but it's a great application. Taking care of these. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it actually reminds me of the mosaic pattern, right? The heart of God is to when you have your animals work the field, you let them. You don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn, the, the grain, right? <laughs> And uh, that was, uh, that's a really cool picture into the heart of God, because God cares about the animals. 
And Jesus himself said that God cares about sparrows. Just because he cares about humans more, it doesn't mean he doesn't care about sparrows. And the tender mercies of the... That's right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. They're cruel. I knew the pastor once. And uh, it's, a, it's an Oklahoma thing. I'm not really, I'm not really into it. Um, it's definitely like an Oklahoma thing. Um, where kicking cats and and saying dogs are cool and cats are awful and, and things like that is 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 part of some sort of deranged Jeffrey Dahmer style culture down there. And there was this pastor that I absolutely love, still love, still respect. And he bragged about how when he was out door knocking, he came across a cat that wasn't even bothering him, and he booted it with his foot. And wear boots and just sent it. Yeah. And at the time, everybody just laughed and they thought it was just so charming. And I thought, even then, even then, I thought, that's that's, cool. that's terrible, dude. Like, what? What do you? What's wrong with you that you would just get some sort of good feeling out of kicking? Not only kicking an animal as if it somehow made it. It doesn't make it one percent more okay. But this is a stranger's animal sitting on their own doorstep. And you went out door knocking to invite this guy to church and you just booted their cat to kingdom come just because you don't like cats? Shame on you, you know? I went up to a pastor's house in Tennessee one time and their pet dog was covered with ticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really too thing. bad. They, they treat they, yeah. animals, are different. outside animals. Yeah. You know? And thankfully, I do know many wonderful people in, in this north, south, east, west who do take <laughs> care of their animals. It's great. But... Um, you know, I, I did notice that in that micro culture where I was, because the pastor hated cats, guess what all the preacher boys did? Mm -hmm. They hated cats too. And they emulate that sort of thing. And I had more than one pastor growing up who detested cats. And as a result, I was like, oh, cats. And then I grew up and I was like, <laughs> I love my cat. Domino's the man and he runs the house. We don't talk about it. Our cat. We're not allowed to eat it unless. The other way around. Right? She slaps us and we walk she by. Bites her, slaps <laughs> she bites us. She slaps us. She slaps us. She slaps us. She slaps us. We walk yeah. by and she'll just like. Yeah. You keep saying, oh, they do worship them as gods and the cats have never gotten over it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Laura brings a good question. How can you possibly respect someone who's cruel to an animal? I will say, um, yes. it's the same, right? It's okay. the same respect that, I, I guess I mean to say is that the respect I um, still have for them. And, and I, I, I do respect, you know, what good they do bring. Uh, it, it fell off the edge of a cliff in that moment. And I can't even say in that moment, I think I was still processing it. Right. But now I look back and I say, um, that probably is a revelation of some deeper, some wrong, right. Something wrong. Right. And, and you look, and I'm not trying to make a big deal of it than it is. I'm really not. But it is a big deal. And you it look at... It starts with animals. Right, it, that's, that's what I was going to say, Kim, is whenever you look at these profiles of these serial killers, they really do, like, start with animals because they're helpless, defenseless, and they and they hurt them. And, um, you know, I, I don't I don't understand how anybody... <laughs> We have we have a wonderful doggy here with us tonight, and he and and he just made his will known to knock over a water bottle. And just, great, great pets are welcome Not here. Your attention. Yeah. Well, a great example is my great grandfather had Jersey cows. He milked them, yeah. and those things were pets. Yeah. To where he you know be walking beside the cows, and yeah. he just lift you up, sit you on back of the cows. Yeah. And I was like, no big deal. Yeah. yeah. Most cows would go nuts, but oh, and Jerseys are nice cows. Yeah, but, but Parroy's cows literally did walk up to you and you yeah. had them like a dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. They, they were okay with that. They were, they were pets. I've seen indoor pigs, little pet pigs. And, uh, you know, so, and here's the thing, right? Okay, so honest question. Since we're here, we love these things. What about a spider? <laughs> right? We say, oh, kill all spiders. Okay, all right. Well, let's let's figure out. Where, right, yeah, they kill mosquitoes. Okay, then what about mosquitoes? You know? Um, well, it, you know, if you're a Hindu, yeah. Right, right. That's the Is thing, right? Hindu or... So I think it's, it's a silly endeavor as it may seem. Sweet At God. what point um, do you, Destry says, dogs are better than cats, my opinion. I won't argue with a preference of dogs over cats. Uh, I find myself one day I think cats are better, one thing I think dogs are better. But either way, we don't kick either one of them, my soul. But, um, but anyways, um, 
really, let's ask the question. A lot of folks say, oh, I, he wouldn't hurt a fly. Right? You heard that expression before? Mm -hmm. Because it, it seems like well, so. if you kill it, it doesn't hurt. Right, exactly right. You know, that's a good point. It. And I think that actually might I'm go toward the, the, it might contribute to the conversation and that you have a pest, right? But you'd say, well, sometimes a, a mouse can be a pest. So then we're kind of in between spider and cat. Like somebody has a pet mouse mm -hmm. yeah. and somebody treats mouse like this. And so I will say, we we had a cat growing up. If you agree with us or not, it's completely irrelevant to the discussion. It wasn't me that did it. Um, somebody in my family, one of my parents, <laughs> wanted to give Taylor, our cat, a birthday present. So they went and bought a mouse and let Taylor <laughs> chase the cat around and catch the or chase the mouse <laughs> around <laughs> and 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 have fun with the mouse. So the cat had a field day, but at the expense of the mouse, you see. Yeah. And so we're literally introducing like a cat and mouse scenario. Someone would say, well, that's fine. It's just a mouse. Yeah, but you try buying a cat for your dog on your dog's birthday, and then all of a sudden you're in a realm of actual cruelty, right? I bought a, a cricket, cricket for a hamster. A cricket for a and hamster. And I felt so bad. I took the cricket out. Right? Yeah. You're not going to eat his legs off. I used to buy crickets for my tarantula, you know, and, well, yeah. you know, and or to buy a Christian for your pet lions if you're the Roman. Yeah. Well, that's where I was going, right? Because <laughs> then you have a food chain and you say, okay, it is immoral for a lion to be given a human. It is immoral for a dog to be given a cat or another dog. We would agree with this, right? So is, so is it immoral for a cat to be given a mouse, right? So at some point, everybody really does have to find out what they're counting as a soulish well, it's animal. Well, not a vermin mouse, though. That you right. Know. Right. So, a vermin, but then again, and I'm, I'm being antagonistic on purpose, a vermin human and a, you know what I mean? Could we have classes of humans in the wrong space? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, he's a child of Belial. We can just, so at some point we have to say, okay, at what point do we intrinsically value the life of an animal and where do we draw the line? So Amber and then Susan, sorry, you had your hand up for a while. Um, so the, the, beast in this uh, kind of leans more toward like your cattle. Correct. Pardon. So like the the righteous man, he regards even the animals that he's going to end up slaughtering. Hmm. And yeah, eventually he will. But yeah, the tender sheep. mercies yeah. of the wicked and like, and that one um, is, is like, it, it says by, uh, by extension, the womb. So like correct, correct. That, that I think of like obviously abortion right away. Like mm -hmm. the the righteous man, he even cares for the life of his of the these animals, pets, whatever it is. He even cares for his beasts. But the wicked man uh, doesn't even care for those things which he ought to have the most compassionate care for. Right. Right, I agree, and I and I think that's a really, really cool way to bring it back to, you know, our, our world. So it's like I say, you know, this pastor who kicked a cat, um, any respect that I had for him, and say I really look up to that guy, it had such an effect on me that I actually damages my ability to say that. I can still say, well, I'm thankful in the way that he contributes mm -hmm. to the learning of the scripture, and I, I don't think he's an irredeemable person right otherwise we'd all be irredeemable mm -hmm. but i will say that in terms of being able to look up to that guy i see such a flaw because i think it does reveal a darkness of heart that why wouldn't it affect other things you know so mm -hmm. susan and then Red uh, as far as the guy kicking the cat right that's uh we're supposed to walk the narrow path mm -hmm. and that's a step off of that path towards psychopath yeah oh yeah oh yeah and quite literally in this guy's case because he literally went out yeah literally to do it on purpose an example and i know he was extremely harsh but my grandfather's father this is during the great depression down in arkansas they farmed with mules mm -hmm. and they ran teams of mules to pull the plows and the wagons and my grandfather's an older teenager overworked one of the mules and almost killed it mm -hmm. to the point where my great-grandfather was abusive and punished my grandfather in accordance to you kill that animal you're literally killing us hmm. because that is providing food for right. us right um so it was it was a there was a mutual need of each other to treat one another right because they depended upon those mules mm -hmm. to provide food when you couldn't just go down to the market and get a loaf of bread you right. had to grow your own wheat right because they were currently starving mm -hmm. well and here's 
um, Robert Alter, it's, it's, it's commentary on the literal direct to English translation of the Hebrew, which reads, the righteous man knows the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Here's what he says on this. It's really neat. He says, here the antithesis between versets takes an interesting turn. The righteous man is so compassionate that he has an intuitive sense of the needs and discomforts of his beast. Yeah. The wicked person, on the other hand, is so utterly devoid of compassion that even what he affects to be an expression of mercy turns out to be cruel. Yes. Like, like he doesn't even have a good way of measuring what mercy is. Like letting prisoners out. What's that? Like letting prisoners out. Wow. Yes. Without uh, any justification. That's right. Oh, we're being good. Right. No. Right. Well, and actually you think about you think about the absolutely repulsive and unchristian chattel slave trade in the transatlantic slave era. People would say, oh, I'm, I'm going to give my slaves a day off. I'm going to make them not have to wear their fetters and I'll double their ration. But what you think is neat is still well within the trenches of cruelty. You think you're being kind, but you're so deep seated in cruelty and oppression that you've lost sight of what being kind is. Um, sparing further wickedness does not equal being good, you know, at all. So I, I feel like I'm backtracking and I, I, I feel like I, I earned a good backtrack. But the, the, the question of how can you respect a person who is cruel to animals, um, the short answer is you really can't. I mean, you, you, really, you really can't. I, so I guess I should rephrase and say upon introspection, I, I should say I'm thankful for any good that somebody can contribute. But as a person, someone who would deliberately, uh, um, willfully cruel to a living creature, um, no, I don't think you can and should respect that person at all. Uh, so I'm glad you asked that question, Laura. I really am, because I think that gives us a, a reason to think about that. And I, I love Laura's heart toward animals. And even if you say, well, I don't, I don't feel it as intensely approached in my approach toward animals, I think it's one we can all learn from, to be, to be sure. Mm -hmm. um, that, that all being said, the point of the proverb is sure. As he takes ten seconds to formulate it, it can't be that simple, right? It is. It is. It is clear enough to to be phrased this way. A righteous or good man is aware <clears throat> that even his mule or cow or dog or cat has some degree of feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. They can feel fear. They can feel sadness. They can feel happiness when you get home, even though you've only been gone for five <laughs> seconds, right? There's something there, and there's enough of a soulishness. Somebody said, somebody argued and said, they don't have souls. I'm not, I'm not arguing whether they do or not. That's irrelevant. The word nefesh has been used of animals in the book of Genesis. Oh. They have soulishness. Um, and so Amber and then Kim, sorry. Um, and then there's, I also think about what you talked about with God's faithfulness. It's not... It's not just about the animal. It's about who are you. Right. Right. Uh, the author of this proverb is painting a picture of two different kinds of people. And it does say a lot more about one than one might think. Kim? We're stewards. Yes. We have dominion. Yes. But yes. doesn't it say, it was? is it in Genesis, of, maybe it's the flood about every soul mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, the, in the sea yep. was killed and that... that I'd have to, I don't have. And I, I just don't know whether that, you know, what that. I have. I always um, wondered whether it was about ships. Four, yeah. Or about critters. No, I have, I have four of my translations present. And one of my ones that I don't have is my Hebrew one. Um, but <laughs> souls is the word used to describe animals and people. Nefesh, the word soul is from the Hebrew word nefesh, which literally means something that has um, air in the throat. And you say, that's a little weird. Well, that's how the Hebrews thought. They, they didn't know anything about your brachioles and your, but they thought there's air going through the windpipe. It's breathing. So they wouldn't have thought about a spider or a mosquito as a soulish being. Um, and a mouse would have been considered a creeping thing, not a beast of the field, so to speak. So they had their own categories. Um, so I suppose a lot of it is subjective, but there does come a point where it's not subjective anymore and you're being a monster for... And even, even if it is something like an ant or a fly, I do, it does give me pause when someone finds some sort of pleasure in dismembering a live anything. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? That's, that's kind of messed up. 
super messed up. Could yeah. you imagine Jesus being cruel to an animal? Right. I can't no. imagine that at all. No. Um, one no. of the earliest stories of Jesus, which is not recorded in scripture, mm. I'm not saying it happened, <laughs> had to do with Jesus as a child, uh, fashioning clay animals and yeah. making them real animals. Mm -hmm. you see? Uh, I, I think, do you think I can have it under authority that Jesus absolutely loved animals? He made them. So, <laughs> you know. All right, who else has a thought? Pictured as a lamb. Well, I know it's in the New Testament. If he feedeth, you know, he, how he's making a bear for our needs. And if he feedeth the... Oh, you guys help me. I, I don't know where you're going yet. Well, if he's going to take care of the sparrows. Sparrow, 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 sparrow. Yeah, <laughs> okay. If he's going to take care of them, then you know, we should. We should care yeah. about much. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. That's a great point. Now, somebody brought up uh, Kevin, who's awesome. Not You're an awesome Kevin, too. Wow. And I love you. But Kevin, who's awesome, um, Kevin Lachance, he actually helped us build this platform up here. And um, he asked a very good question. What about hunting and harvesting an animal? Example, a turkey. Toby thought of this first, and I want you to know that. Okay? No, I'm just joking. And, and I should have thought about it, too. I mean, I eat, I was going to bring it up when we talked about um, pigs. I said, there's house pigs, but I eat pork. All right? I'll, I'll say a blanket statement. Um, when you have chickens that are crammed into cages that are way too small, mm -hmm. pigs that are mistreated and have to sit around on their own deposits. Industrial farm. Industrial farm. I don't think that's right. I don't. I don't. I don't. And so, well, so many people are being fed. And veal, the way veal. Right, veal. And then, um, what's that one, Amber? Is it duck liver, foie gras? Goose. Wow, goose, wow. goose liver. Frog gras. Yeah, okay, so I got everything wrong. But, you know, the thing of the thing. Force fed. They will, they will take a funnel and just shove food down in there. I think those are immoral practices. We're maximizing things and we're and it's not even healthy. Those are immoral. But what about taking your son? I'm going to create, I'm oh. going to paint a picture. Okay, Kim, go ahead. After Look what God said after the flood. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. So what about taking your son out? Oh, sorry. I, I want to elucidate in case you're not familiar. God said after the flood. After the flood, animals are going to be afraid of you. And you can hunt them for meat. I mean, could play into why they're afraid of you, right? So there's that. There's no longer that harmony that existed. Um, so, Ralph? Can you imagine then the heartache that must have been in God's heart when we had to sacrifice animals because mm. of our sin? That's a great point, Ralph. deaths were That's a great point. to cover us yeah. up. That's and a huge we were point. Mess. And the oceans of blood that was shed. That's exactly right. It's not, I don't, I don't think it was, people say, oh, the sovereignty of God, it exists. We need to live in that tension. But in terms of the keeping up with humanity aspect of God, I don't believe for a second that God ever wanted to have to have bloodshed to cover the sins of man. Uh, I think that's taking foreknowledge a little too far to say that God wants bloodshed. Um, no, no. In fact, when Jesus died, that was one of the great, thing, great things about it, according to Hebrews 6, is now there is no more need for bulls and goats. He was the final lamb. And I think that's part of the step of redeeming crea creation back to God. You see, um, Kim. Also, during the Passover, didn't the family kind of adopt a lamb for a week or so before it was killed? I believe, I don't know if that was... It wasn't adopted, it was more of an observation. L observation period. Well, or... Sure. It was, um, I've heard that it was kind of part of the family. Sure, and named. He was given a name, it was Watch, and it was, it was, if I understand, and again, I know so little about this, but from what little I know about it, it was brought into the family, observed, but it was treated unlike a regular animal. You know, it's given better food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you had to watch over it. And I guess it would have become kind of part of the family, if I think about it that way. So, right, let's full circle back to the question. If I'm going turkey hunting. You know, um, some would say, well, that's immoral. Let's say this. Oh, let's tie it right back into this proverb. The second to last verse in this proverb addresses that very thing, guys. Proverbs twelve twenty seven. The lazy guy doesn't even cook what he killed in hunting. But the substance of a diligent man is what? Precious. Even in, and, and I know precious means like rare and special, but, but even in death the life of that beast is precious, which means I don't go trophy hunting 
and just let the meat rot. Um, at least not because of like laziness or pride, et cetera, et cetera. When I hunted, I haven't hunted in forever, but when I've hunted, it wasn't just for a buck, even though a 12 pointer would be great. I, 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 I enjoy that, but I would like the food to feed my family. Absolutely. I would. Psalm 74 says that God killed Leviathan to feed Israel. That yeah. is true. That is yeah. true. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and, and I have actually, I, I'm acquainted with a, uh, a person who is full on vegan and they believe it is sin to eat meat. I answered that person by saying, well, Jesus ate fish and Jesus ate lamb. And he told Peter to eat all kinds of food. And I'm not saying this for dramatic effect. The person literally didn't respond to me at all. It was the end of the conversation. I don't know if that counts as a win, but it's at least a stalemate. You know? <laughs> so if I go out my 30 out six and hunt a deer, I, I think I have a societal and practical obligation to harvest that meat and at least give it to people who will eat it, even if I'm not going to eat it. I think that's right. I think that honors the like even Native Americans who were very pantheist and panentheist right. in their approach. Of them. Right. They'll honor the spirit of that animal in many ways. And they'll thank the animal for giving yeah. his life to feed that person. And you say, yeah, that sounds sweet, but you would think differently if it was a human. I absolutely would. I'm not just going to kill a dude and be like, hey, thanks for dying. No, 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 no. Right? That's twisted. <laughs> well, look at the, on the American plains during the uh, 19th century, the buffalo hunters. The bison. That's what I was thinking of the bison, too. Yep. Just, just, they wiped out. Wiped out the, the population. population for their hides. Yep. It was just for hide. Now, if everybody was freezing to death and you needed that, sure. But it was currency. And just like we do with American currency, what do you do when you run out? You print more. You know what I'm saying? So that's, it, it's, it's, it's. It's, you say, are you anti-capitalist? No, I'm anti-greed. And greed finds its way into anything. You know what I'm saying? Well, That's that created a, an industry for the bones, too. Sure. For, for oh, sure. Oh, sure. You know? and, and I think that if we could have been more sustainable and say, oh, sustainable. I don't like that word. Well, I think God wants us to be good stewards. And being sustainable where we can is a good thing to do. And it, it's actually pretty simple. If you want more bison, don't kill them all. Right? You know what I mean? Could you need bison to make more bison? <laughs> so hunting. What about hunting? I think it's very appropriate to hunt responsibly. I think that the Bible says that God put governments in place. And so don't poach. Right? But at the same time, let's say that there's a big a famine in the land. And I don't have a license. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a worst case scenario. I would absolutely kill an animal to feed my family. I would. But to kill an animal for the for exclusively the thrill of the hunt, I think, if I'm being really honest and I'm just airing my I'm just wearing this right off my sleeve, to kill something for the thrill of the hunt alone, I don't know that that's that that's I think that's a bit too craven for me to I don't like the idea of killing something for the thrill of the kill. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't know that that's where we should be. Or just for a trophy. Right. Yeah, or just a trophy, right? I now, feel that way about fishing. Okay, that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah, fish and gut the fish, eat the fish, provide for your family. Or, and one might say, I have a, I want fish. I want to have a taste for fish. I could go to the market and buy fish, but I want the sport of fishing. It's a nice ritual, and I will eat the fish. I think it's very possible to incorporate responsible rituals around eating animals. In fact, Jesus did. <laughs> you know? um, but I think the whole point is being responsible stewards. And I will say this, for anybody who might still struggle, I have, I've looked into this a lot. I once watched a... Uh, Wildebeest, I guess, is appropriate, being torn apart by oh. by a lion while it was standing. Yeah. And it was in pain, clearly. But the most interesting thing I noticed as I looked into the wildebeest's eyes was not, not that you can, you know, I'm not, I'm not being a, you know. <laughs> I looked into the owl's eyes and I knew its name was Mordecai, right? Yeah, I'm not going to. But there was no sense of, angst or depression or what am I going to do for my family? There is not that level of consciousness present in most of the animal kingdom, if I understand it correctly. Um, I could be wrong. I'm not a zoologist. I'm as much of a zoologist as anybody in this room. But I don't, I don't believe that most of the animal kingdom fears that death, um, the unknown aspect of it, as much as they respond with a self-preservation. Now, when you get into the more domesticated areas, you've got dogs, especially dogs and horses, 
um, even elephants. I think there is a, a level of soulishness that can approach that sort of thing. And I'm not afraid of admitting that. Um, but everything we do should be done responsibly. Rhino horn, people hunted rhinos to grind their horn for a, um, you know, if you don't mind me saying, a sexual advantage. That was the, the, the belief about rhinoceros horn. Yeah. Um, and uh, elephant tusk was for, look, you can make piano keys out of something besides ivory. It's going to be all right. You know what I mean? So everybody's going to have to draw a line where they're at. Um, there's an old PETA billboard, and it showed like a, started with something very insignificant, maybe, um, oh goodness, I, I don't remember exactly where it started, maybe a fish, and then it went up to a chicken, then a pig, then a cow, then maybe a turkey, then a deer, and then it showed a dog and a cat, and maybe even a baby, and the billboard said, where do you draw the line? And then somebody, I don't know if it was done on Photoshop or if he really went up there and did it, he drew a line in between the chicken and the dog. And he was like, right about here. Fair answer. <laughs> he drew a line. He said, okay, I'll eat these animals, but I won't. Um, what it comes down to in the Christian realm, not just the philosophical realm, but in the Christian realm, the, if you believe Peter reported his vision as coming from God, which I do, then we're left to concede that God gave his stamp of approval on eating all manner of animals, all manner of animals. Um, doesn't mean that all manner is good for us. That wasn't the point of what God was trying to tell Peter. He was trying to introduce Peter to what? Remember Acts chapters 10 and 11? The Gentiles. The unclean animals were not clean. You see, it was an illustration. So that doesn't mean that you can eat all the pork you want and think that God didn't know what he was talking about. You know what I mean? So... Um, so there's that, right, on animals. Any other thoughts? I don't want to move right on. There's a couple more gems in here I think we can uncover. So the, the end is be gentle to your animals. If you hunt, don't just hunt for the thrill of the kill. I don't know that that's the best thing. Sustainable this, sustainable that is appropriate to talk about. Let's not get so knee-jerk reaction against everything that comes out of, like, the left side of Capitol Hill that we reject some of the good that can come from, you know, that, that area sustainable practices is very important to be kind of devil ad, does devil's advocate ish you know you see the left loves to rip apart you know this lawyer a doctor was in africa and killed this poor little elephant you know on reserve but what they don't tell you is that's sustainable so that land can sustain because it is a preserve yes. and they have to thin the herds. That's correct. Oh, and, and then yeah. they, they take that meat and they feed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Correct. They don't say that part. No. So they, the doctor paid, you know, thousands of dollars to be able to go shoot the elephant. And then they go and harvest the meat to feed mm -hmm. people. So mm -hmm. they don't say that part when they're trying to advocate for the animals. So you I mean, would... there's a balance there. You have to look at everything, not yeah. just one little part. Well, and a lot of folks who raise concerns about killing a lion are the same people that have no problem with killing 75 million babies. Yes. So let's let's consider that, too. We cry at ASPA, a, ASPCA and PETA commercials, and we don't cry. You know, I'm just throwing that out there. Oh, like the mother cougar that was killed and left a, left a kitten. I'm not familiar. And, um, yes, no, no, the cougar killed a woman. Oh, dear. And in California, and so the cougar was dispatched yes. and the cougar mm -hmm. left a kitten mm -hmm. and the woman had kids and they raised more money for the oh no cougar <laughs> oh dear Lord. yeah that's how we are she on the go like go fund me or something yeah then they Oof. did for the the woman's children well in the balance of that look Oof. at the fines and jail time you mm -hmm. for killing a for destroying a bald eagle egg or a sea turtle egg but it's no big deal to go down here to Planned Parenthood and kill your six-month-old child inside the womb so I did a I didn't spend too much time on it because it's a polarizing topic and everybody else handled it way more than I do but I did one episode on the Roe v. Wade thing and my point was my what I didn't address the scriptures didn't even address the statistics didn't call anybody names um, I just wanted to bring up some of the logical reasons that people use to defend it. And one of the logical points I used was we're not being consistent with our defense of life. Yes. In the state of Maine, any bird of prey is protected. Any bird of prey, raptors, eagles, whatever, hawks. 
I mean, if they attack my chickens again, they're not protected. Okay, I'm just throwing it out there. Um, Cause they're, they're pests at that point, yeah. they're, they're invaders. But uh, they're protected. For the sake of the camera, I, I will never harm a, a hawk. I would join them and join their <laughs> roost and become one of them and learn their language. <laughs> That was more like a, that was like a choking llama. All right. So anyway, so like, I don't know that one, but, but, uh, but no, like, and, and that, that, and so the inference of that, excuse me, the implication of that is that you cannot harm an egg. And all that egg is in the nest is the yolk and some white. It is a clump of cells. Some bacon. It's a clump of cells. But they know that if that clump of cells is left alone, right? In the safe place where his mama is taking care of, you understand what I'm saying? That it will become a bald eagle. So it's protected. Uninterrupted development, whether it's a clump of cells or not, uninterrupted development will lead to independent sentient life. And so anyways, that's just a thought there. It's gonna catch my bread upon the water and see if that comes back later. Can we have some real fun? Can we go really bad? Let's do it! You're not allowed, we are not in the state of Maine allowed to harvest minerals. It's against the law to harvest minerals in the state of Maine. Well, I picked my nose two days ago, so. So, but I'm going somewhere with this. Let's do it. And a certain aisle side of Congress um, wants everybody to drive electric vehicles. Like, okay. you like the thing that you drive. It's hybrid. And, um, okay. And so we push the electric vehicles and the hybrids and things like that. But where do we get the minerals to sustain those batteries? We get them from child labor, child yes. slave labor in Africa. Yes, coltan. When we literally have trillions of dollars worth of lithium just up here in northern Maine that we're, that it's illegal for us to harvest. Yep. There's enough lithium up here in northern Maine to make enough battery-powered cars for the world. Yep. But we can't harvest it, so we're going to get let five, six, seven-year-old little Do you know African when that people. ban happened? Because my ex-husband's family owned it. I do know hmm. Shion, he's part owner of a dig and on the other side of that, and they actually have lithium on their dig. Oh on my there, goodness. That they would be billionaires if they lifted the laws and mm -hmm. could harvest the lithium. Um, yeah, it's illegal for you. You can get gems and rare precious metals like that, but you can't do like lithium and things like that because it's against the law in Maine now. So yeah, Shion. Yeah. The same stuff okay. they make the psychotropic medication out of? Yes. Is it really? Uh, well, it's oh, lithium. I thought yeah. we were talking about cotan. Yeah, lithium is. Yes. Yes. Yep. So, no. Hey. So, it's okay. Think, uh, that's a good point, too, right? What are we valuing? What right. are we valuing? I, I just, guys, I'll be I honest. So. I think I mentioned this six months ago or so. Um, we look back at, like, George Whitfield. We talk about how can you respect somebody who, who George Whitfield, we quote him in preaching all the time, and he was a slave owner. Yeah. And he preached pro slave trade. Yes. And we say, oh, well, now he was just a product of his time. Okay. I, I don't particularly accept that. Right. I don't see but, that. But, right. You know what I'm saying? So, so that's my point is we say, if you just read your Bible, it's very clear human dignity. And I wonder what things 200 years from now, people are gonna look back at my generation and say, you guys all used iPhones. And we're gonna say, so? Didn't you know that that was child labor that produced those iPhones? You know, I'm just throwing it out there for you, right? I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm just saying like, what are we gonna look back at <laughs> and say, what are, what are our great grandchildren gonna judge us for? Yeah. I hope that they'll show me the same mercy that I try to find in my heart toward you know what I mean? I'm just throwing that. It's not an easy topic, clearly. <laughs> but, yeah. Adam. If you go to, uh, speaking of George Whitfield, if you go to Old South Church in Newberry, Massachusetts, um, one way you could tell he was a slave owner, they have they would have these, like, quiet areas where they put the slaves, mm. but you could hear them if they were talking to each other about their slave owner. So wow. the slave owner, they would auction off the pews. This was back in the day. They would auction off the pews, and the member would buy the pews. That would be their pews for the entire year or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, this was back when they had this tobacco uh, cans or whatever, spittoons. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
One way to tell that he was pro-slavery, he would have a separate area for the slaves, mm. but the, then the master could hear if the slaves were talking about that. Yeah. Well, and you know, and that's the thing, right? This is in a church. This is in a church yeah. building. Right. And we say, well, those people, all, all of those, all of those people are damned. Well, thank you, Lord, that his mercy endures forever. Yeah. Um, I just wonder what they'll damn me for. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's just something to think about. Well, uh, I was thinking back because I you know it's, it's my interest in history, my family tree, that there were churches that even when Native Americans got saved, they weren't allowed to be at the front of the church. They would stand in the back mm. or outside mm-hmm. to hear, but they weren't allowed inside. And some of the, some of the preachers actually left the church when the church yeah. in England was in yeah. Left because if, if he got saved, he's my brother. It doesn't matter what color. That's right. We should be able to sit in the congregation together. Yeah. But at that time, it was considered only right that they stood up back because they were less. Yeah. They couldn't be trusted. They might be dangerous. Even though they said they were saved, they didn't trust them. So they didn't stand separately. And it stands to reason that... Church. Some of the greatest Americans who ever lived were people who, even in the heyday of chattel slave trade, were standing against it yeah. in the heyday of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they weren't liked then, but we look back and we say, thank you mm-hmm. for standing up against yeah. that horror. Um, and we say, well, I mean, if you look at the, we are not allowed to look at the state of things today and pretend that they wouldn't be vastly different if it weren't for the injustice of slave trade. And I've heard people try to justify it and say, well, they were doing it to each other first. I'm sorry, since when did that even begin to make it okay? You know what I'm saying? Like, let's not let's not pretend like it's in any way conscionable to, anyway. Well, let's move on before we get, I wanted to share one more. Verse 23. This one I'm sharing because uh, Michael needs this one. Michael has always needed this one. Just like the one that says, even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted wise, and a man that shuts his lips is a man of understanding. You say, you need that one right now, to which I'd say, no, I was looking at me in my head. Here's one, verse 23. Uh, I'm, I'm reading, I'm going to read this from the NLT. I think the NLT, if you're reading Proverbs, NLT is a great place to get a little clarity if you struggle with understanding the King James. NLT is a great uh, alternate source of understanding. And I mean, maybe NLT is, this will be used for like our family Bible time because uh, it's, it's just so simple and easy to understand for young people. NLT stands for New Living Translation. Uh, this is what this says in verse 23. The wise don't make a show of their knowledge, but fools broadcast their foolishness. And it's CNN. <laughs> CNN is 97% popular in airports, 3% popular at home, right? But um, notice the contrast. Can I show that to you? It doesn't say the wise don't make a show of their knowledge, but fools broadcast their knowledge. It says fools broadcast their foolishness. So if you think you're smart enough, I'll put it this way. If you think you're so smart that you have stuff to show off, you're probably not as smart as you think you are. If you think you know something, but you say, I don't always have to be the one who talks, you're probably way smarter. You know what I'm saying? Than the other guy in the room. And, uh, You know what the worst part is? If I don't make a show of my knowledge, how will people know that I'm smart? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Pride. I pride run deep, guys. I told you that since I got here. I don't struggle with anger or unforgiveness. I don't. That's not me. Pride. You say, I don't think you're a very prideful person. I've done a great job tricking you. No, I'm just talking about. But here, it doesn't mean I don't fight it. It doesn't mean I don't attempt to be humble, right? But sometimes I'll be thinking, how do how do any of these people get driver's licenses? If only everybody would drive like me. You get the idea. I'm at the speed limit. Here's the. I said today I was going 66, and I looked, and I'm like, and I set my crew went doop, 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 all six, and it felt like I was slowing down to a snail space to go down to 60, and I was like, oh Lord, reward me. But I tell you this, I tell you this. Um, the, I told you about the Dunning-Kruger effect. In other words, the people, if you ask drivers, are you better than half the drivers on the road? Like over 90% would say they are. So that leaves 40% at least that's wrong. <laughs> um, so I think, I think, I'll, I'll be, uh, I think I'm a better driver than most drivers. Chances are that might make me not as good a driver as other drivers. You know what I'm saying? I've never taken a professional driving course. Just because I've somehow avoided hitting anybody 
except for that one dude in college. I did bump him because I was looking at my, my girlfriend at the time. <sighs> uh, Candy was in the back seat in the middle. That was that was that was a dumb reason to get into. It was my buddy. I hit my buddy, and he had a tank. He had a tank. I don't even think there was a dent. Johnny Bennett. He was pretty cool about it. Anyway, <laughs> so I guess my point is like sometimes I'll hear somebody saying something really stupid. I think that I have a hard time knowing when I'm correcting that person for the sake of their edification and the person who's listening to them. I don't want them to understand it as to know something that's not true. You know what I mean? But sometimes I have to ask myself, am I correcting this person just because I'm right? I will share this. I'm so good at being proud that I don't even realize when I am. You say, Pastor, what are you doing? This isn't the Maury show. What do you know? No. I'm, I'm saying this because I think all of us might have this in common. I'm so good at being proud that I don't even realize what I am. I might even think I'm being humble when I'm being proud. Our hearts are deceitful. Right? Maybe I'm confessing this to you in humility, but maybe there's a certain amount of pride. Well, I'm the most humble person you know. Did you read my book? I've told you this 30 times. The three most humble people in the world and how I won the other two to Christ. That's my favorite one, man. I love it so much. But, but I mean... But I am I am not the guy who can just let somebody be wrong on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite quips from a TV show is when uh, it's in Parks and Recreation, where um, Ben Wyatt is that his name? He's sitting there, and somebody said something about Star Wars that was factually incorrect, and uh, and Ben and Ben says, uh, "You know what? I, I'm not even gonna try to dignify that with a response." Actually, it's going to bother me if I don't. And then he just goes on to correct him, you know. I'm that guy. I just can't, you know. And sometimes I think it's for, like, the good of humanity that I'm like, let me just set the record straight. So I do have to examine my motives and say, am I correcting this guy because I'm right and I like being right? I don't know. I don't know, guys. But maybe there is a certain virtue in just shutting the trap. You're doing him a favor. That's what I think. Kim, yes, yeah. No, but that's, like, how I see it, right, you know. And I have to be really careful about about my my pride. And you guys know this. I, I like being in control too much. That one I feel like I've done a lot better with. I, I do because I've seen. I think I've seen the value of different contributions, even if I'm not super crazy about the flavor of what everybody brings to the table. I'd rather have a salad with celery in it than a salad that I make all by myself, because at least when it has celery and it, it has stuff that I wouldn't have thought of. Who would have thought about, hello, I would have never thought about putting mandarin oranges and nuts into a salad. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't have thought of that, but I saw it somewhere. And now I know that it's the best gluten-free salad. Grapes are good, too. What is it? Grapes. Mm -hmm. See, grapes are like cherry tomatoes in a salad. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you even trying to be, right? Seven I years. can eat you by yourself. Lasting longer. <laughs> what? Oh, if you put, if yeah. you put good tomatoes in it, then the acid doesn't break down the lettuce. Okay. So you can pop that sucker back in the fridge. <laughs> so, so here's what I do with grape tomatoes. I used to buy a salad. I used to buy a salad from Starbucks for lunch almost every day. It's like nine bucks, super expensive, but I was really trying to lose weight. And I succeeded. It was good. I'll never do that again. But I spent nine dollars a day on salad. Oh, okay, sorry. And I would, there were three cherry tomatoes in the salad. Delicious salad. And I would stab them with my fork first and eat them just to get them out of the way. Because I don't, how are you going to stab salad and put that little, put that big, come on, guys. Use one tongue of the fork. You see what I'm saying? If we have to come up with a, a theory on how to do this, it probably doesn't belong in the salad. Well, they're great tomatoes. See, that's what they are, Kim. They're, they're great tomatoes. They're, they're yeah, great. Right. And then you try to, I'm, I'm not going to have to sit in the microbrew story hour, but you try to stab it. It doesn't want to be stabbed, guys. Let's just make Chasing a commitment around. to not put cherry tomatoes well, in the salad. Especially if you can't see the things. Kim, Kim yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just cut up a beef steak John tomato. said it's in here somewhere. Cut up a beefsteak tomato and put it in the salad. <laughs> <laughs> but Amber's right. If you cut it up, then the acid will leave. It has to be a good tomato. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, if you make them at home, there's no, there's no point for that. Right. Sense. That's true. That's <laughs> true. You can set them yeah, on the table in a bowl. She used Roma to me. No, my phone is like ringing. Nothing there. No, no, I'm like, all right, 658. Time to stop talking about salads.
Actually, it is six fifty. <laughs> I do try to go to seven fifteen. You know, but do, does anybody else have one you wanted to share? I won't. I won't blather. That's my commitment to you on this last one. I won't blather. I've shared what what I wanted to share. <laughs> anybody else want to take it away? Don't feel like you have to. I just wanted to give the What was the King James version of that verse? You I'm read? I'm so glad you asked. I will read it and present it without comment. <laughs> don't don't <laughs> laugh, laugh first. <laughs> All right, it's Ralph. I was laughing with you, Ralph. No, okay. I, I, no I'm glad you asked. I'm just um, with you, buddy. Thanks. I think it was 23. Okay, so the NLT was, um, I want to read that to you just so I have the contrast proper. The NLT. Proverbs 7 23. No, we're in 12 23. Yep. Uh, says, the wise don't make a show of their knowledge, but fools broadcast their foolishness. This says, a prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. Um, that's one of the things I like about consulting a modern translation. It's just like, oh, I conceal knowledge all the time. You know what I mean? Like, but if we know what, you know, it kind of intersects the circles of that language and this language. Kim? I like the verse that's the, a fool is right in his own eyes oh, or man. something like that. Uh, which one was that? In this week's. Oh, what, oh, I thought you were referring to something in this week. I don't think it's in this week's. Okay. I think it. I thought it was. And maybe it was. Let's check it out. Something like that. Helps to come in the right chapter. Hey. Okay. <laughs> no, well, I, I, well, no. I didn't read it at home. We trust I thought... you. We need some great examples of that. Listen to some of the news reporters when they're trying to speak about something they think they know all about when they're asking the expert. <laughs> Yes, first trying to give an answer, they going on. Well, what about this? This <laughs> it's just I just no, I'm saying Kim just knows. You can't say something smart. Don't say anything at all. <laughs> what does that read in the authorized version? The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he okay. that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. I was thinking the Lord waits the spirit. Yeah, that's yeah. That's, okay. that's what I'm saying. So, what one is that? Uh, Fifteen. So one might also say, "Fools think their own way is right." But the wise listen to yeah, others. Okay. Hey, that addresses the control thing I was just talking about. But presented without comment. Besides that one. And and that one. And that one. Oh, okay, sorry, I got two verses confused. I'm, I'm like seventeen. Seventeen? He that sh speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, hmm. but a false witness deceived. Boy. And I see that as by being truthful. We are respecting other people. Mm -hmm. You can read through 12 if you want. Lie lie and and tell falsehoods. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a way to mistreat something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm keeping my commitment, guys. I want to say something about everything. <laughs> Maybe that's pride. <laughs> I, I won't ever make that face again, I promise. <laughs> you know, we're <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, sorry. I uh, I just got another another CSB. I think I have like four CSBs now. <laughs> because this was for like 136 bucks and was on sale for like 25 I, I cannot say no to that. What is CSB? CSB, Christian Standard Bible. It's, uh, okay. it's like the new edition of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Still produced by Holman. So whereas the KJV is the Anglican slanted Bible and the, um, the MEV would be the charismatic slanted Bible, ESV would be more of a reformed or high church uh, slanted Bible. This is practically speaking like the Southern Baptist Bible. It's been, it's, it's, it's very much, very much so. Uh, well, amen, brother. Sorry. <laughs> what is, uh, what's verse 11 say? I like verse 11. The one who works his land will have plenty of food, but whoever chases fantasies lacks sense. <laughs> oh, boy. Chasing fantasies, baby. Sorry. What verse? Uh, verse, verse 11. Oh, I was kicking dog licking my foot. <laughs> no, it's just my foot. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Chasing fans fans shall be satisfied with bread, but if he that follow vain persons is what he Oh, he that follow with vain persons. I can make you rich. Let's go down to the OTB. Here's the worst part. What? 
Oh, oh, oh off track betting. Oh, yeah. oh okay. I know what that oh, nobody knows what OTB is. Okay. Leave it to the yeah. pastors to know what OTB is. I didn't know is. that nobody knew what um, that was. I'm so sorry. I just I'm like. I'm there all the time, babe. Ray <laughs> says, um, Clancy says pineapple doesn't go on pizza. Clancy? Clancy. Clancy. You're dead to me, buddy. You're dead to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> Clancy, you can eat whatever you want on your pizza, but so am I. Oh, 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 oh. Kim, we I have standards. I can't remember here. what verse it is. It's like the second or third. There's a contrast, but it it appears like the two things are not related. I can't. Is it the beginning of the proverb? I think I remember something like that in the King game. <laughs> I knew I was going to have multiple arms for this one. Because I use my phone for the streaming and I don't have my iPad Pro on me, so I figured I'd log all my Bibles here. I have your other iPad Pro. Remember what the contract Your iPad Pro. Is about Whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Yes. That's the one. That's, That's the it. one I thought of, too. I almost stopped when I was reading to say, notice that the contrast is a bit unusual, but I didn't. I'm so glad you brought it up. Who, he, uh, oh, oh, uh, Ooh, he. <laughs> um, okay, so instruction here has to do with correction. Instruction here has to do with, um, um, now I got, I told the instructor I was in love with you, stuck in my head. And that is entirely your fault. Ooh, eat, uh, uh, bing, bang, bang, tell all the bing, bang. Ah, okay. So, so uh, who so loveth instruction loves knowledge, but he hates reproof is brutish. Um, okay. Knowledge, or excuse me instruction there has to do with like a, a corrective instruction mm -hmm. and so uh the csb says whoever loves discipline loves knowledge but the one who hates correction is stupid son what does the nlt say there in 12 1. where's the bible oh kev stole it from you he gave it to me oh well fine i'm trying to give it to you oh you had your hands full literally i just love this i love looking at other ways of understanding it it's so cool all right 12 Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I get that. They simplified a little bit. Remember, NLT is kind of like, um, um, oh, TLB, the Living Bible, and Message, MSG. MSG, huh? It's kind of like those, and that it's not striving to be a literal translation. It's, it's kind of paraphrasing. So here's what it says in this one. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Oh. But to learn, you got to love discipline. That's, ooh, that's yeah. good. I really like that that slant on it because... Because I asked you to look... No. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. These books are never staying closed. Uh, back, back in uh, Chapter 11, mm -hmm. it talks about he that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. Yes. And the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. Yep. First part of that, how does it translate? Which verse is that? 29 of 11. Um, those who bring trouble on their families inherit the wind. The fool will be a servant to the wise. And that is a set contrast to verse 30. Okay. Normally in each verse you see a contrast within itself, mm -hmm. but 29 and 30 are contrast because Verse 30 says, the seeds of good deeds become a tree of life. A wise person wins friends, or he that wins souls is wise. So talking about bringing trouble on your families, you inherit the wind. You remember that from Ecclesiastes, Hebel, right? The wind, nothing. You have nothing. And the seeds of good deeds become a tree of life, something that perpetually bears fruit. The opposite of wind, especially in Hebrew thought, trees were super important. This I like. I like our times on Wednesday nights very much. Mm -hmm. Very, very much. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to give them up for anything. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye, live streamers. Oh, I like that. Kevin said... Um, Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Don't always have to say your every thought. I like that. That is very good. That is very good. Thanks for that, Kevin. Oh, Ray Collette's Proverbs 12.9. I know we're, it's only 7.08.
today's gone wonderfully perfect. Proverbs uh, 12, 9. He that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. I don't have my Hebrew with me, so I'm going to check that one out. If you don't mind my consulting the... 12. Well, we talked about battling and have some cash. Then. Yeah. Better to be an ordinary person with a servant than to be self-important but have no food. I like food. I like food, too. There's all these people walking around and rich and famous, but they're actually not that rich. I'd rather be unknown and have enough to take care of my family than to be popular and not be able to take care of my family. I did find it interesting how many celebrities go broke. Maybe because the Bible is true that riches make their way like an eagle toward heaven. Well, and, and you read stories of, like it's been in England, the nobility put on a good show. Yes. But, you know, when they're at home, you know, mm -hmm. they sold all the silver and... Yep. They've sold the rugs and the furniture's gone and they're living on tea and toast. That um, theological program, Downton Abbey. Um, <laughs> now it shows how these guys were basically giving tours through the Abbey, the mansion. What the tourist didn't know is that they were leaning on that money to pay the servants because they had a house full of servants and things like that. But just to do that, they had to have tours through their own home. And of course, the, the, the matriarch of the home was, not the matriarch, she was still alive, but the, 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 not the dowager, but the lady of the home, right? She wasn't too keen on the idea. She's like, this is our home. No, it was him. He said, well, we're not gonna have them parade in our home. You know, that was a weird accent that he doesn't have. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no. And so they're doing that for money, whereas it could have just been easier to go get a job at McDonald's and just have enough to provide. I know, right? <laughs> labor. Buy a bungalow. Labor. Right, right. Oh, that's a good. Oh, that is super good. Yes, yes. Today I saw an ad for a Land Rover used for like $140,000. And I thought, house? Land Rover. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And it, it, listen, if somebody has a lot of means and they've worked hard for it and they want a Land Rover, I'm not going to chastise somebody for getting a Land Rover. Just, you know, I hope you're doing a lot with your other money. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to judge you, but I will say this for somebody like me, that's, that's self importance for me to say I need a Land Rover. And then I'd be broke and I would be paying a thousand bucks a month, a mortgage payment for a vehicle instead of being able to build up an emergency fund for my family. That's, that's a pretty cool option. Yep. All right, live streamers, we're out. Love you.